Greetings, and welcome to this latest installment of the Centurus Knowledge Series. Today, we're pleased to present to you on the topic of planning for a Power BI Enterprise deployment. Today's agenda, we'll do some introductions, and then we'll get to the main part of the presentation, Power BI rollout and support, covering the topics of why a rollout strategy is needed, focus on the stakeholders, rollout consideration, and Power BI support. After that, we'll do a real quick Centurus overview for those of you who may not be familiar with what we do all day, every day, and some additional, almost always entirely free, great resources. And then again, stick around for the always entertaining and valuable Q&A. So introductions, joining us today, I'm pleased to be joined by Mr. Greg Nash. Greg is a Centurus partner, Joining us from Australia, he's a principal consultant at Dear Watson Consulting, a Microsoft data platform MVP and Power BI user group leader based in Melbourne. He has 20 years of experience in enterprise IT, and more recently, he's specializing specifically in Microsoft Power BI adoption, mentoring, and development for organizations of all sizes. My name is Michael Weinhauer. I'm a director here at Centurus, and among my various roles, I have the pleasure of and seeing these knowledge series events. So last thing before we get into the main presentation and I hand the floor over, we always ask a couple of questions of our audience. So we've got two polls today um, asking which BI platforms uh, are your organization using? And you can select all that apply here, whether it's Power BI, Tableau, Cognos, or something else. Sharing the results set back here. So three quarters, Power BI, only a third, Tableau. And again, about uh, two thirds, they're using Cognos. Another roughly 20% using something else. So that's an interesting split. A lot more, um, I mean, maybe it's the topic, but uh, Power BI definitely a lot more than Tableau. And then another poll, this one is a single answer. So please select the statement that describes your Power BI rollout and adoption thus far. So somewhere on the spectrum of you don't use Power BI and you don't plan to, or you plan to use Power BI, but you haven't gotten around to rolling it out yet, uh, or Power BI is rolled out and it's got a lot of adoption, or you've rolled it out and it has kind of, yeah, you know, mid medium adoption, or you've rolled it out and it has low adoption. Share the results with you. So a lot of people planning on using it, but haven't rolled it out yet. That's interesting. And only about 10% not planning on using it. And then the bulk of the rest, uh, kind of between medium and low adoption and high adoption. Um, interesting, okay, great. Well, thanks for sharing your insights, people. Hopefully you, you guys find this uh, informative as well. I'm gonna hide that, which will take us back to the presentation. And with that, I'm gonna hand the floor and the microphone over to Mr. Nash. Greg, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mike. G'day, folks. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to my presentation on Power BI rollout and adoption. Um, it's uh, it's a, another great privilege to be here and to be able to present to you guys about this. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to clarify, you can make sure you're in the right session. Don't want to waste your time. There's a lot of information to talk about when we talk about uh, Power BI rollout, but uh, I wanted to talk about what this session is about and what isn't it about. So. First, we're not going to talk about how to build Power BI reports in this session. We're not going to talk about DAX or Power Query. Um, we also won't be talking about like how to organize your workspaces in Power BI. Um, there's a lot of consideration just in that one topic um, or how to sort of configure and do admin in the service. What we will be talking about is like, how do we get Power BI into our organization? How do we how can I give you the best chance of success in terms of things you need to consider when you're talking about Power BI as a service? And really what to think about before you give access to the users, before you actually uh, get this thing into people's hands inside your organization. So Power BI rollout and support. We're gonna cover a few things. We're gonna talk about why first, why do we need this, a strategy at all? Can't we just turn on Power BI? And it will work for everybody. You know, what are the? Um, why do we? Why do we even care about this subject? The second thing is, there's a lot of things you need to think about before you even consider rolling out, right? And we need to touch on those things. I want you to make sure that you've uh, that uh, I haven't forgotten anything before we get to the rollout phase. If you think of the rollout phase as when we 
we go, uh, we're actually deploying Power BI uh, to our users. And then of course, all the considerations for the rollout itself. And then post rollout, what kind of support considerations do we need to do? What, what needs to happen with Power BI uh, going forward? So let's start with why do we need a rollout strategy? So primarily the reason why you would need to uh, to come up with a strategy for your rollout is really the people in your organization, right? The biggest tech, uh, challenge for technology rollouts is always going to be people. They tend to resist change. They don't know what they don't know. And you'll need some kind of structure to help manage that changeover. Your people might be used to you know, looking at uh, spreadsheets and, and, and printed out PDF forms, and you're looking at a transition to a tool that is interactive, um, it's, it's much more difficult to get uh, information out in a sort of a paginated PDF style form. It's an interactive tool. And so there's that changeover that you need to think about. And you also need to think about, well, who in the organization is going to run the service? Who's going to provide that support? Uh, how are people going to interact, find help and all that kind of stuff? The second reason why you need a, uh, a rollout plan is because of the technology itself. Power BI is a very big platform and you might not necessarily need all of this stuff. You can see here, there's potentially hundreds of things you need to consider. It can get very messy if we don't uh, understand the pieces that are relevant to us. Um, and we have to think about things like governance. This is a data platform. So governance and security and privacy of your data is really, really important. Um, but you also have to think about all the different skill sets that might be required to deliver some of these things, right? You've got uh, things inside uh, Power BI like uh, ETL, Power Query. You've got DAX, the uh, data analytics expression language that people, how do people learn that? Uh, the uh, modeling of, of data and star schema, uh, Kimball based uh, data modeling, and then of course the administration of the service itself. And so you've got this big, potentially huge platform that has a lot of different potential components that you can use and, and knowing which pieces are relevant to you and which aren't is gonna be really important. And the other reason is of course, you wanna save some money, right? We wanna prevent that rework. We don't wanna be rolling things out and having problems with it. We wanna lower the cost of changing over from one technology to another technology. And also thinking about licensing and we'll do a quick brief look at the licensing in Power BI today. Um, some of the Power BI, like Power BI has license options that are some of the most expensive things inside the Microsoft uh, environment, as well as some of the most cheap. And so understanding the types of licenses you need and uh, what you need to know and who is going to use which license. So before we roll out, what are some of the things we need to consider? Probably the most important thing is that we really need to think about like who in your organization is going to be using that. And particularly it's around executive buy-in. Right, so executive buying is going to be is going to be essential to ensuring that you've got support to be able to roll out a platform like Power BI. It's very, very difficult to just build a Power BI report and send it out into the world and hope that uh, people will uh, just adopt the platform. Uh, you'll 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 need to have some kind of strategy around how to do that. Uh, identifying those end users, who are the people who are going to use that service, and then um, knowing those different personas and who they are is, is going to be really important. Are they going to be developer? Are they going to create content inside the Power BI uh, service? Uh, are they skilled people or are they just uh, regular knowledge workers? Uh, are they going to admin the service? Do they train people? Do you have champions? Uh, all that kind of stuff. You also probably want to think about a pilot project, right? Like, so something that's high value, low complexity, something that can uh, be delivered easily, that is going to give you uh, good adoption for people's introduction to Power BI. Uh, and that ability to prioritize the projects and you find that inside larger organizations, executives tend to jockey for position in terms of getting new technologies into their area and uh, you'll need to ask them to provide the relative priority to you. So, and sometimes that can be uh, create a bit of uh, tension between executives, right? If you're in a very large organization of who gets to go first. And so you're really looking for that high value, low complexity project when you're thinking about that. 
And then of course the licensing, right? What type of licenses do we uh, need and, and when do we need them and who needs them? So let's briefly look at the licenses for Power BI. So the first license that a lot of people, this is the way a lot of people get started with Power BI is with a free consumer license, right? This is people who can build content for themselves. But they can't really share anything. And so they will share, either they'll uh, output it via a PDF from desktop, or they might create a presentation in Power BI and share it like I'm presenting to you now, but uh, they don't really have the ability to share the interactive piece. And so if that's okay for your organization, then that might be, that's all you need for Power BI. And that's fully functional. You know, you can do a lot of stuff with the Power BI free license. Typically though, most people are looking at the consumer or pro license. So this is that uh, idea of people creating content inside the organization and sharing it to other people who consume it within the, uh, within the organization. Now, every consumer of a, of a Power BI report needs to have a pro license. So there's no, uh, a pro and then a free person can consume that shared report. If you're sharing to somebody, that person also needs a pro license. So that's something to consider. Uh, there's also this concept of a premium license. This is typically for uh, larger organizations. They're sharing via the Power BI service. Um, if you need paginated reporting like bank statements or invoices, um, uh, that is in, as a part of your reporting environment, then you may need to look at a premium license. Consumers in this environment don't need that pro license. So you can have thousands of users and they all come into the premium service. They don't need, you don't need to buy a, a license for every user if you like. And so that's a, um, that's a consideration for those sort of larger organizations, but it's a, it's a monthly service. It's a dedicated service. And so there's, there's costs associated with that. If you're talking about people who are creating content, they're going to typically need like a pro license. So people who are building content in Power BI for sharing this, your analysts, your Power BI users, your developers, uh, anyone like that is also going to have a pro license as well as those consumers. Uh, there's also a concept of a premium per user license, which is a fairly new thing. So you can have a user license that has premium features like the paginated reporting and that kind of stuff. This is typically for your analysts, uh, but where you're in an organization that where you do need those extra features. And so that'll be an, an, an analyst uh, report. But another, another thing that you need to consider here is that those consumers of, of that content also need to have that PPU, the premium per user license. So you can't have a, a pro user consume premium content. And so again, you have to think about uh, that extra uh, that extra cost potentially for your premium users to consume premium content. Uh, it's not very expensive. It's only a, a, you know twenty bucks a month or something per user uh, extra, but it is something you need to think about. And then of course you've got your admin and support people, right? And so they're the people who are your IT operations. They're going to provide support to your uh, Power BI people. They might do the administration in Office three sixty five or debug reports, and they're going to need a pro license as well. So they're kind of the main user um, cohorts that you have usually inside organizations and then, and then the people, um, the licensing levels that they need. Now you have a few edge cases as well, like web, uh, web developers who might do embedded content and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's pretty easy to look up which type of license there. And it's, the default really is the pro license. Another consideration before we roll out is who's going to manage the service. So consider the day-to-day -day operation of this service, who's going to manage it, who runs it, uh, who adds new users, for example, or assigns licenses, uh, who sets the standards for your development. Do you create a look and feel that is uh, common across all of your reports? And who's going to administer this works, all the workspaces? Because so in Power BI, you've got all this content, it lives inside workspaces, and you need somebody to set the standards of how those workspaces work. Um, is somebody going to be monitoring the service? And one thing to consider here is that maybe you want to create like a center of excellence or a, or a virtual team that are responsible for some of these tasks rather than just lumping it all onto IT. I think there's a it's common to think around BI services where IT has to manage services like this. Uh, Power BI, you can actually uh, manage quite effectively without having to rely very much on IT services necessarily. And so that's something for consideration. 
And then, of course, finally, before we get to the actual rollout of the Power BI service, do consider governance and security. It's a data platform project. We need to consider that data governance and security really. Uh, it's very, very important, of course. Uh, you need to have those conversations, any workshops around governance and security before you roll out. Make those decisions with those, uh, with those stakeholders. Uh, there's a great webinar um, from Centurus on the uh, on governance on on just enough data governance, which is a great introduction to this topic. Um, I recommend that you go and check that out. Uh, things like data accuracy, data quality, who owns the data is a really important piece of the governance uh, world. Uh, and you're going to have operational people interacting with your Power BI or your data teams because those operational people are responsible for entering the data for uh, creating um, that data inside your environment and you know m they might have uh, ownership and quality issues around that. You also have people who are going to uh, provide stewardship of the data so people who who uh, who ensure that the data has flows through correctly and and has that data quality just like a pipeline. And so all of those things are the things that we have to consider before we even start thinking about rolling out our Power BI environment. And as you can see, there's lots of stuff there to, uh, to get your teeth sunk into uh, before you uh, even consider rolling out desktop to people. And so uh, we can't go into a lot of detail in that because we really have to get to our rollout considerations. So when I say what are our rollout considerations, we're really talking about sort of six main areas. One is our uh, rollout approach, then uh, the actual rollout of Power BI desktop itself, so the technology, if you like, uh, selecting that pilot project, uh, the change management of, you know, uh, managing that change, then communications, and of course, training. So let's talk a little bit about the rollout approach. So there's really, uh, two main ways of approaching your Power BI rollout. And the first way that I want to talk to you about is what we call a phased rollout. So a phased rollout is really, it's a where corporate BI, that sort of this idea of corporate BI is either your BI team or your IT team. Uh, and so they're uh, specialized data people inside your organization and they do the first piece, right? Which is that they evaluate the product, they set those governance and security standards that we spoke about, they do the infrastructure setup. Uh, they look at support structures and how that's going to work. Really is becomes an IT led solution, if you like, and they put together a training program. So then after that's finished, and so in the second phase, you have the business uh, engage with the tool. So they build on that foundation that's already been laid down by IT. Uh, they will do, uh, they'll identify those champions inside your Power BI uh, environment and then they roll it out at a team or at a department level. So that's kind of like a two phase sort of rollout and you can do it in many phases as you roll it out team by team. Uh, the second type of rollout is what we call an organization wide rollout. Or sometimes people call this a big bang approach and this is where really things happen at the same time. You, you roll desktop out to your business at the same time as corporate BI or the people who are responsible for administering the service are uh, doing the evaluation, governance and security standards. Uh, you're setting that managed service, um, you're setting up the infrastructure and that kind of stuff. The benefit of doing this way is you, you're, it's sort of time to value is much shorter. So the business can start using the tool, getting used to uh, the Power BI desktop, how it kind of works. They can start playing around. Uh, whilst uh, IT and the BI teams are sort of uh, understanding the service a bit more. So you get the benefits of the tool almost immediately. Uh, the downside is that you can, it can sort of, there can be sprawl before IT are quite ready to uh, adopt the tool. And so you might have to have a bit of a rollback of some of those considerations around uh, what, um, what people use uh, and, and, and how things like workspaces are organized. Uh, you might need to um, uh, mess around with that later down the track. And so some organizations like this approach because of the time to value and some prefer a phased approach. Okay, so talking about rolling out Power BI desktop. So Power BI is a, is a desktop 
uh, based tool. So you've got a content creation piece. It's a it's a Power BI. It's called Power BI Desktop. It's like a it's part of the Office suite. You can download it. Anyone can go to the PowerBI.com and download the Power BI Desktop tool. Um, we need to think about the rollout of this tool inside your organization. So why are we thinking about Power BI Desktop roll rollout? Well, the first reason is because when you're creating authoring creating and authoring content inside Power BI, you'll have to think about the governance of that content, right? And and do are people using templates or are they using are they just creating stuff uh, in in their Power BI environment? Uh, you have to think about the capacity, not only the capacity to support people who are using uh, Power BI Desktop. So do you have enough support structure around to have a team of 30 people using Power BI Desktop? Uh, ultimately, Power BI is a self-service tool, and so in the ideal world, Power BI Desktop would be rolled out to the end users. In Microsoft's vision of the tool, if you like, this Power BI Desktop is going to be sent to everybody. Um, and so, you know, that is something that you need to think about in terms of support. Also, you need to think about update frequency, right? So this is, Power BI gets updated every week, actually, in the service and every month in the desktop tool. So you're going to have this constantly uh, evolving tool, potentially, that uh, users will be discovering new features. And if your desktop rollout strategy is, you know, on a maybe a yearly cadence or, a, or if your app develop, your app deployment strategy for your enterprise is quite slow, then Power BI is always going to be ahead of you. And so you'll be getting questions from users around, you know, how, how can we have this new feature? Oh, there's this cool thing that came out in Power BI that we'd like to use. And uh, you might need to deal with that as, from a support perspective. Uh, another thing around capacity is like the capacity of the desktops that you're installing Power BI on, Power BI on itself, right? So if you're deploying Power BI out to people and you've got uh, your, your desktops are only say four gig of RAM, Power BI is quite memory hungry. You need to understand what the implications of that are um, in terms of when people are developing stuff, they might not get the experience that they want. So how do we look at our Power BI desktop rollout? Um, consider that phased rollout. Obviously, you want to deploy it probably to internal BI and IT teams first. Uh, get them to check that all the capacity things, like the, the desktops will support it, that you can build content, all that kind of thing. Um, we uh, obviously want to be planning for that as we roll that out. Uh, we also want to align our desktop rollout with our training, right? So uh, there's lots to learn in the Power BI world, and, and so people are very hungry for training, you'll find, when you first adopt the tool. Uh, and so you need to ensure that there's uh, available training programs, approved training programs for people to, to use uh, Power BI. And then uh, when they get their desktop, they want to be able to find that training or be able to participate in that training uh, as quickly as possible. And then, of course, ensure that you're ready for audit and security questions around data. So this is a data platform. Uh, you're going to be uh, audited if you're in the large enterprise. And so you need to ensure that you understand the implications of, OK, so when somebody builds an import model inside Power BI, uh, what happens with the data that gets that gets saved inside the PBIX file uh, on their desktop? What are the implications of that and so forth? Okay, in the next phase of our Power BI rollout, we have to look at uh, the selection of our pilot project. So we always recommend that we do a pilot project. It's a really great way to introduce the tool to the organization. Uh, it's a great, like I said, that high, high value, low complexity project is going to give you the best foot forward in terms of your uh, deployment. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, it helps with uh, quicker development, so you can get something out there quickly. You get a high, uh, high value uh, re relatively quickly. Uh, you can sort of get wider reach in terms of you can sort of advertise it to the business. Um, the impact of the business should be much greater because we want to uh, we we're, we're, we've got a structured project that we're sending out into the world uh, rather than sort of a, a random people doing their own little thing. And you want to minimize the disruption to people as they change over, right? And so you need to introduce this tool in a specific way. Uh, how to do uh, your pilot projects? Probably the best way to do it is with your existing semantic models. And what I mean is like maybe existing Cognos or SSAS models that already have a nice reporting structure. You might have some reports inside your organization 
that are already based on these sort of uh, mature data platforms. And some of those uh, are really, really great for moving your Power BI project into, right? So you can create fairly, because the data is already structured, a lot of the work inside Power BI obviously is in that ETL space and getting the data shaped correctly so that it works for the report. So if you've already got data in that shape, then you can usually uh, put Power BI over the top and create reports really, really quickly. So that's a fantastic way to start your Power BI sort of journey inside the organization. So if you've got existing data warehouses, for example, or you've already got high level aggregate data that's ready to go uh, and ready to, uh, to report on. Uh, one thing that I will say, if you've got things like Excel or access based solutions, tread carefully around those. Uh, the reason is, is because Power BI is a reporting tool and Excel uh, access uh, less so, but specifically Excel, uh, there's that concept of being able to update data inside the tool. And so Excel solutions, I find, don't make great targets necessarily for Power BI um, reporting unless they're purely uh, Excel reports in that they're consuming data only and they're, and they're analyzing data only. If there's any kind of data entry piece inside your Excel sheet that you're trying to move over and everybody calls them reports, but they're actually sort of mini applications inside Excel with macros and that kind of stuff, uh, steer clear of those. You have to, they're going to be complex. They're going to you have a lot of considerations around how that data gets entered, where does it get stored, and Power BI doesn't necessarily provide that for you. So you need to think about that. And you also uh, want to uh, create this uh, development process that you're doing, right? So you've got this prototyping stage. And so this is where you're building out those prototypes and you can refine this while you're doing this pilot project. How do we build a prototype? How do we sort of throw something together so that people can see what it's going to look like and then uh, create new reports? So now the next consideration is change management, right? And so We've rolled out our Power BI desktop. We've had a look at that pilot project and selected that and had a look at how we're going to do that. And now we're looking to manage the changeover from either our old tools to this new sort of environment. So why do we want to do this? Well, we need to make that case for change with our users, right? We want to ensure we get a smooth transition from the, the users who are used to the old tool and, you know, it's. It's almost impossible to get a person who really loves Excel off Excel. And so, and Power BI doesn't really try to do that. It's a different tool in a lot of ways, but you do need to have that conversation with your users around what they're using now and transition them to this new environment. Because Power BI is different to a lot of other tools, it, like the a lot of legacy reporting tools. If you're using Crystal Reports or Cognos or things like that, there's a very different look and feel. The way the interactions work is different. The way you model data is different. And so those things need to be spoken. You need to have that piece, that conversation with your, uh, with your users. Uh, what's the best way to do this? Uh, usually organizations will have change management specialists if they're larger. If you're smaller, you might consider um, uh, getting a change management specialist in. You could uh, reach out to Centurus and, and they can help you with this change management into this new data platform. Uh, there are cha whole change management platforms. You might have a tool that helps you with your change management. Um, obviously, that's uh, something that you can do. It's really about managing the process of transition, right? And 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 you want to in ensure that you have a process in place where you've thought about, okay, in stage one, we're going to be here. And then in stage five, this is where everybody's using Power BI and they're all happy, you know? And so what are those steps from from the initial sort of uh, sort of uh, looking at Power BI all the way through to, okay, now Power BI is here inside the organization. Uh, you wanna be able to provide clarity to people on timelines and potentially run them in parallel. So, you know, you're, you've got your two tools and, and so when do, the, when do we switch from one to the other for this team? And, 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 and so you wanna, you wanna think about the process, then think about the staging of that process, the, the workflow of that process. Uh, and then and how long do you run in parallel so that people can reconcile their data, which is really, really important for a lot of people. Okay, so we've thought about our change management process and now we're in, ready to communicate this with the rest of the organization. So why do we need to think about these communications? 
Well, obviously, to avoid that confusion and uncertainty that comes with change, right? So people uh, need to know what's happening and when. It's, you know, this idea of signposting. You're traveling along the highway and you can see how far away you are from the goal, you know? And so you want to create, uh, ensure that your communications are coming out to people at a cadence where people can see where they're up to and, uh, and see how far they've got to go. So how to do this? Uh, we really need to like align the purpose of our of our users, right? And so uh, the first thing you want to be doing as a part of your communications is ensure that they're structured in a way where you're, they've got a, a particular purpose for that communication, if that makes sense. So you're, if you're um, if you're rolling this uh, Power BI desktop out, you'll need to have communications that align with that rollout of desktop. Okay, we're going to be rolling out desktop. You might be doing that through maybe an email when the person first gets that uh, desktop installed from IT, an email also automatically goes out to them explaining what desktop is and here is how you get information about this and ensuring that those two things are in alignment. Uh, you also need to align it with your licenses, right? So when that person gets their license and they can log into the, to the service, we don't want to just leave them out there uh, on a raft by themselves. We want to give them those communications. Here's how you log into the service. Here's what it can do. Here's what here's our policies around it and that kind of stuff. Ensure that you've got that governance uh, uh, overview available for people so that they know who uh, what they can and can't do with the Power BI service. Uh, they have access to their key contacts and they really know how to get started, right? And so they're the, the key things around uh, we're getting Power BI, so purpose alignment is we're getting Power BI because we, uh, because you know, this is a strategic direction the whole organization's decided to go down. Uh, we want to make sure that we create a data culture inside our organization, that kind of stuff. Here's your license, here's what you can and can't do, here's the people, and here's how you get started, are really the key things inside those communications. A great way to, uh, oh, we're going backwards, excuse me. A great way to, uh to do comms is to create videos so you can create uh you know like all these modern tools and a lot of us are working from home uh you've got these uh what the 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 idea of creating you know videos around how to do uh, certain things with your data inside your organization right and so why would we do this it's a great way to get started uh, for people to first consume the power bi service they can see sort of the interactivity they can consume it on demand and it's a format that most people prefer these days, you know, just like a webinar. Uh, people like to be able to consume this information in sort of a video form uh, on demand. So a good way to do this is to create project videos like an introduction to a project. Uh, you want to highlight those key capabilities of Power BI or the project that we're building. And so a demonstration of the, the report itself and how it interacts with each other, how you would use this specific report or set of reports. And then, you know, next steps and go to. So what do you, what, what can you do from here? How do we, how do we get value out of this particular report inside Power BI? So you're creating this video that's like a demonstration of how to do these things. And you can embed that video back into the Power BI reporting platform via an app and people can consume it as they're consuming the report. So they can have one page where it shows the report and the second page is the video of how to use the report. And so that's a great way to do it. Okay, so we've got our comms out there now, and then we've spoken a little bit about our training platforms. So now we need to get those people trained, right? We need to get the people who are using Power BI trained in how to use the Power BI desktop. So why are we doing that? Uh, we wanna make sure that we're enabling our employees appropriately, right? Uh, we wanna minimize fear and resistance inside the organization, and training helps to do that, right? So the more people know, the less they're going to resist and fear uh, the changeover. And to minimize risk of problems where they accidentally share data they shouldn't have. You know, there's options inside Power BI to say share to the web and to share to uh, people outside the organization. And people need to understand the implications of that. Um, you can turn them off, uh, but also a key piece of this is going to be training. So how to do that? Well, you need to do, you know, your training needs assessment, uh, there's that establishment of training programs and leveraging those online resources. And we'll talk a bit more about this in the support area. 
Um, and really the key thing is you know, piloting that training and getting feedback. You can of course engage with uh, partners like Centurus who can help you with your whole uh, data platform training needs. And so they're the six main considerations for our Power BI rollout uh, area, right? So we've really got, uh, we spoke about our rollout approach. Uh, we spoke about that rollout of Power BI desktop. So getting desktop out there and thinking about what our um, PCs can handle, uh, selecting that pilot project, uh, talking about the change management piece and maybe some of those communications around uh, the the uh, using videos and things like that to communicate these new projects and of course training. So after we've rolled it out, we're really getting into the post rollout uh, consideration. So really this is about support. How do we support this service going forward? Who's responsible for it? What are the different types of support that we need to provide? So really you can break down uh, you know, support for pretty much any IT service into three different main types, right? The first one is what we call break fix. So people are broken down on the side of the road and they need someone to help them right now. The second piece is called um, enhancements. And so that's either your, your minor enhancements. So using the car analogy, that's the pimp my ride style thing where we wanna add bullhorns to the front. Um, and sometimes they're major enhancements typically when we talk about major enhancements, we're talking about big projects. And then the third type is what we call enablement. And so that's like a GPS, you know, so it's an enhancement that helps you be better at what you do, you know, and so uh, we really want to uh, provide our users the three main different types of support. So let's have a quick look at some of those uh, needs. So break fix, uh, excuse me, I just take a drink. So our users are broken down and they need support right now. Obviously, this is probably a mandatory service for you inside your organization. Um, this is something that you're going to have to think about in terms of, uh, you know, it has to really has to be there. Um, when you're deploying Power BI as a project, it's probably your break fix needs to be included in that project budget. How are you gonna create uh, this break fix support for a particular project? Um, you'll need to make sure you've got budget for that. Uh, people who understand uh, your specific, so your specific uh, project is going to be important. So knowledge of the project and what they're trying to do, and also knowledge of the Power BI tool, right? So you really need to know the project well, and you need to know the tool well. And you're off, often in BreakFix, you're working towards service level agreements. So you create agreements between the different teams to ensure that if something breaks here, we've got an hour to fix it because it's critical or we've got a couple of days to fix it. And so coming to those agreements early on uh, when you're thinking about the support is really important. Uh, if you've got for your date, so that's for project break fix, if you like <clears throat> your day-to-day uh, -day break fix. So what we call like business as usual style break fix, um, that's also gonna be a mandatory service, um, but that typically comes from your IT budget, right? So that's your IT team is gonna do your business as usual sort of uh, break fix support but they still need to have a good understanding of the Power BI service. So that knowledge is gonna be important for your support teams. And as usual, they're gonna be uh, working towards service level agreements as well. And quick turnaround is always the thing in IT support. So ensuring that um, your, your support people have the appropriate training to be able to support this service. When it comes to minor enhancements, this is usually perceived as an essential service. It's not necessarily mandatory, but a lot of people will wanna make minor enhancements after projects are finished. You know, there's that concept of a, a warranty period. If you're an external consultant that deals in Power BI like me, then everything we build, it tends to come with some kind of warranty after we finish building it. Oh, something broke, or you wanna make a minor enhancement. There's always a discussion about whether that's a chargeable item or not a chargeable item. Uh, when you're external and then the same sort of thing when you're internal as well. Um, people generally will want to add little bits and pieces around the sides and that idea of scope creep inside projects can be uh, can be a real problem. So you need to think about that. How many minor enhancements are we prepared to uh, do and what is a minor enhancement versus say a project? You want to put this inside that project budget so you want to make sure that there's uh, capacity in the budget for to be able to do this kind of stuff. 
Um, obviously, people will need to know what happened before usually, so they need to have that knowledge of what happened in the project to be able to do these enhancements correctly. Um, and obviously, you really need to have good knowledge of the tool like Power BI, right? So uh, they need to have, you need experts in Power BI to be able to, to provide these enhancements for people. Usually, you want to agree the time scale for your minor enhancements. So, okay, we're going to have, say, three weeks of minor changes after the proposed end of the project, something like that. You want to agree that at the beginning, during the scoping. Uh, you definitely don't want to be leaving this sort of conversation to the end where you can get yourself in trouble uh, from a scope creep perspective. Uh, what are our options for break, fix and minor enhancements? There's lots of different options. We can uh, look at Microsoft Power BI support. Microsoft have a premier support system. You could look at your internal infrastructure or your internal BI. And of course, you could talk to partners like Centurus to help you with your break, fix and your minor enhancements areas, right? So if you don't have really the capacity inside your organization to, uh, to you know, have experts available on call all the time because people are still sort of learning the service, then definitely you want to be leveraging partners like Centurus who have people who really know these services, they understand data, and they can bring that knowledge to the table and then you can use them um, as, you, as you require them. And so think about that from your break fix support and your minor enhancement support, uh, definitely. In terms of enablement, uh, usually uh, enablement is more a real-time uh, style um, uh, enhancement for people. So that's going to come out of your day-to-day -day team budget. So this is more operational, the people inside your organization who are in a team and that enablement's often training, right? Uh, they want to get more training. They want to uh, get better at Power BI in some way, or they want to build cooler reports then uh, usually that's going to come out of your training team budget uh, for that organization. Um, to be able to provide that, you need to have a really, really good knowledge of the tool because you need to train people in the tool. And um, a great way to do this is to create like a center of excellence or like a hub where people can come together and share, um, and share knowledge around the tool and how they're using it and tips and tricks and that kind of stuff. And so that's a great way to uh, think about how you're going to enable the broader user group of Power BI inside your organization. Uh, so let's have a look at some of the options. Like I said, that center of excellence is gonna be really, uh, really important. You can have a dedicated Power BI enablement team. So you could have, might have a team inside your organization that's uh, specifically dedicated to, you know, helping people and training them and that kind of stuff. Lunch and learns and things like this webinar are a fantastic way to, uh, you know, further enable people inside their Power BI. You might want to publish it to your internal website, uh, have ongoing training and that kind of stuff, or provide an advisory service. There's a few others. There's like Power BI community websites. There's courses and YouTube videos and that kind of stuff. Uh, YouTube guys like uh, Guy to Cube is a fantastic YouTube thing. You've got Power BI user groups. So I run the Power BI user group inside Melbourne. Uh, in Melbourne here in Australia. And, and that's a really great way. We've got like two and a half thousand members of our user group. We get a hundred people come and uh, share knowledge and, and network and they're all Power BI users. And we, it's a great way for us to, uh, to really create a community. Really the Power BI community uh, is fantastic. There's a huge number of people that uh, they love helping each other, community.powerbi.com. You can go there. I think there's 700,000 questions already answered about Power BI and the service. Um, you can you can pretty much find the answer to anything you need uh, from a Power BI perspective through the community. So that's a, a great one to keep in mind. And there's a bit of a whirlwind tour, I know, and it's a lot of information, and I appreciate that. And that's why I'm glad that this is recorded, so you can go back and you can take notes and you can maybe show this to your team and you can have a conversation about all these different things, right? So you really need to talk about why we need that rollout strategy. Uh, we need to come up with something. We need to have a strategy to roll out all those considerations before we roll out. And each one of those could be their own webinar. You know, there's lots of things going on there, but then also those different rollout considerations that we spoke about, those six main rollout considerations. And then finally that support, yeah, the break fix, the minor enhancements and the enablement support.
Uh, and that is just about it. So there's my contact details. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'd be more than happy to connect with you if you want to talk about this. Uh, this is one of my favorite areas is talking about how do we get Power BI in and how do we get people using it? And so please connect with me and it'd be great to, to chat further. Uh, with that, over to you, Mike. Great. Thanks, Greg. That was a, yeah, definitely a, a whirlwind tour. Always a lot of great information in that presentation. Um, stick around, everybody. Uh, we have a couple slides here before we get to the Q&A. Certainly enter your questions into the uh, Q&A panel, and we'll definitely get to those in just a few minutes here. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because Greg actually sort of peppered that in here throughout, but whatever it is, whether you're dipping your toe in the water here or you're well down the path and you're looking to you know, expand it to the enterprise and harden it and scale it and do all those great things, whether it's strategy and governance, architecture, pilot program development, enablement and training, full spectrum capabilities, we can help you from uh, everything from pre-planning -pre to your ongoing enablement. Um, Centurus is... Uh, we All we do is we focus our expertise on business intelligence. It's all we do all day, every day. We have a depth of knowledge across the entire BI stack. We are known by our clients for providing clarity from the chaos of complex business requirements, disparate data sources, and constantly moving targets. We made a name for ourselves because of our strength in bridging the gap between IT and business users. We deliver solutions that give you access to reliable, analysis-ready data across your organization so you can quickly and easily get answers at the point of impact in the form of the decisions you make and the actions you take. In terms of that full spectrum of BI services, you can go to the next slide there, Greg. Yep, our consultants are leading experts in the field of analytics. You can kind of read through the bullets here. They have years of pragmatic real world expertise and experience advancing the state of the art. We're so confident in our team and the Centurus methodology that we back our projects with a 100% money back guarantee that's unique in the industry. And we've been doing this for quite a while. We've been uh, doing it for over two decades at this point, over 1,350 happy clients and 3,000 plus successful projects, ranging from the Fortune 500 to the mid-market. No doubt you recognize most, if not all of those logos there. We solve business problems across just about every industry and every functional area, including the Office of Finance, Sales and Marketing, Manufacturing, Operations, HR, and IT. Our team is both large enough to address all of your business analytics needs, yet small enough to provide personalized attention. If you're reading some of this and you, you, you see what we bring to the table and you, you think you might be interested in joining the Centurus team, we are currently hiring. We're looking for, uh, you can see the four bullet points there. We're looking for modern analytics solution architect, a senior Microsoft BI architect, ETL developers and others. You can look for those job descriptions at the Centurus website or submit your resume and or submit your resume to jobs at centurus.com. We have hundreds of free resources on our website, including webinars such as this one. We encourage you to visit centurus.com and head over to the resources tab at the URL you see there. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about all our great training in all the major platforms we support, Microsoft Power BI, Tableau, and IBM Cognos Analytics. We offer um, all the different modes from one-to-many tailored group sessions, or sorry, one-to-many mentoring, tailored group sessions, instructor-led online courses, and self-paced e-learning were especially ideal for organizations who are running multiple platforms or those who might be moving from one to another. And we, as you can see here, yeah, there you go, Greg. Um, we provide hundreds of free resources on our website. Again, that's at the resources tab. You can find a great webinars, uh, product demos, upcoming events. We don't have any listed right now, kind of a summer break. Um, but we'll have some more. Make sure you check that. And our always interesting and up-to-the-minute, easily consumable blog. And with that, we are at the Q&A here. And I'm going to jump over to that, get some good questions here. Um, one of them is, so what is the best approach for creating workspaces and deploying content quickly and be able to maintain that easily with, with less effort on IT servicing. Uh, and they're saying, I guess, moving from dev, QA, and prod. So I, I think it sounds like more of a deployment question and, and, and lifecycle management. That's kind of a big question, I yeah. know. 
<clears throat> yeah, it is a that's a that's a that's a great question though. That's one where a lot of people have um, have problems getting their head around. And like I said, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can kind of do that phased approach where your uh, IT is kind of setting the standards in terms of you know what we, what workspaces can and can't do. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the my short tip for that is don't let everybody create web workspaces. Um, that's the the first thing is probably the thing that that um, catches people out most is that <clears throat> when you have workspaces that um, that the sort of workspace sprawl where people are sort of creating workspaces all over the place, you need to have some structure around that. If you want to minimize the uh, impact on IT, then that concept of a center of excellence and then getting the people who are in the center of excellence to manage the service is a fantastic way to reduce your IT uh, impact for uh, Power BI. Power BI, like people want to use it in particular ways, and um, and keeping up with that can be can be a little bit awkward. Um, in terms of that dev test prod uh, deployment style stuff, um, if you're in a premium, if you're a very large um, organization and you're in a premium space, there is deployment actual deployment pipelines in Power BI where you, it creates a dev test and prod. Uh, workspace for you and then you publish to dev and it automatically publishes to test and prod as you as you sort of uh, elevated up the deployment uh, space which you could look into for your organization otherwise it's really comes down to that yeah defining the structure of workspaces uh early on and really really thinking about how you're going to structure those workspaces can be like that's a whole conversation in itself with your end users because um Workspaces, if you think about Power BI content, um, it can be either functional. So you've got like HR reporting, you know, and that's all the reporting team inside HR. Um, like all the reporting team inside HR might want to have access to a particular set of content, but then you have HR reporting, say, across managers, right? So that's where all managers inside your organization uh, get access to a HR report, which is basically their team or maybe the annual leave liability or whatever that report might be. And so you've got functional and cross-functional um, workspace uh, workspaces and, and the way that you organize those, it can get a little bit sort of, it can melt your brain when you're trying to organize this matrix of workspaces. Um, it usually doesn't fit a really specific pattern and you do need to have a little bit of flexibility there. And so uh, getting the business people involved, the people who actually want to use this content, uh, you want to get them involved like through that center of excellence and then get them to manage it. You know, you've got the full capability from an IT perspective to assign a Power BI admin and give them specific rights uh, in the Power BI service without sort of giving up all of the uh, all of the access. So that's how I uh, usually approach that with with people. Yeah, there's a lot there. And again, that's something that you know, we help people with all the time. Um, there's another uh, question that's uh, another kind of a big one, too, around and I'm, I'm not, the question is 100% clear, so I'm gonna to try to paraphrase it or, or, or clean it up a little bit. So it says how to define complexity when you're moving from Cognos to Power BI, knowing that um, some function, there will be functionality differences. It says here that something that only exists in Power, uh, doesn't exist in Power BI, it only exists in Cognos. Um, I would just, if you, if he'll permit me, say, I would say there are potentially functionality differences both ways, right? You're going to see things that are in Power BI that aren't in Cognos, and vice versa. So then, how do you um, uh, how do you kind of make that more of an apples to apples comparison when you're making that move? Yeah, this is a this is a, a, this is a consideration for not just any legacy uh, any legacy platform or any platform where you even from Tableau to Power BI, right? If yep. you're moving making that change, both ways, right? The, there are huge differences in the way that Microsoft have uh, organized their data platform versus the way Cognos and other other um, or, uh, other technology companies organize it. They think differently. They have access to different technologies in terms of IP. You know. Microsoft have access to what they call the Verti Pack engine, which is a pivot table engine, it kind of sits underneath uh, Power BI and Excel and uh, and uh, analysis services. And the the structure of that engine means that the way you interact with the data and the way that you shape the data and prepare it is different uh, to the way that you might do it for other tools. And so um, in terms of defining the complexity, I think that you you do need to 
uh, if you're in that situation where you're moving from a tool, particularly one that has really high adoption and that everybody loves, if you're doing, say you're moving Power BI for, for a cost reason, right, rather than a functionality reason, then that can be a very difficult transition and you, you need to be able to ensure that's where that training piece comes in. That's where you, you might yeah. want to do a phased approach where IT, uh, you know, work with, you know, a partner like a Centurus who really know both tools, who can explain the differences and show them uh, show them how to do that, I guess. Yeah, I think you hit the key point there was somebody, you have to know both tools, right? Mm. If you're going to learn Chinese and you're an English speaker, you need someone who knows both the languages. And there's differences mm. in terminology, differences in architecture, and just differences in, in approaches. And that's why, you know, we've really, we really only focus on those three major platforms. So we're deep in those and our experts can kind of give you the secret decoder ring. Um, because that's an important part of your of any project when you're talking about uh, you know rolling out Power BI, especially migrating off something like Cognos. Um, so can your pilot project be the first phase of your rollout, or is the pilot project discarded in that instance? Yeah, so we have um, we have two concepts of pilot project when we're doing like a structured Power BI adoption piece and and um, the first one we call the proof of concept and the second one we call the pilot project so the proof of concept project is something that is usually very very small um, it's often based on a you know an existing cube or something it's really an introduction to the tool and you kind of want to make it as easy as possible um, that's often discarded because that is just a uh, can we deploy Power BI? What are the considerations? IT get to sort of uh, dip their toe in the water without committing too much. Um, and and you might sort of, oh, here's a report and we just sort of throw something together to show it, uh, show it working. Um, your pilot project, which is sort of the next phase, that's that's the first actual project. So you that's one where you're looking to build something that will be used ongoing inside the organization. And you know, with Typically, when you're doing Power BI adoption, you're trying to get the person, like the team, people in the team who are uh, to build it themselves. And so that pilot project is a lot about uh, holding their hand while they're building that content, ensuring that, you know, they don't stray off into an area that is, you know, too complex or. And so that the idea is that that continues on and then that team picks that project up and they continue to support that piece of reporting going forward. Great, and um, so here's another question around what are the Power BI development roles that are required for rollout? Uh, Power BI development roles, yeah. So um, you've got, so you've, it, it, in terms of the actual developers, usually when you're doing your your initial rollout piece, you're going to have, uh, you want a, what is a full stack, a full stack Power BI developer, right? So if you think of Power BI, you have to wear kind of, four different hats to be a full stack Power BI person. And so that is, the first hat is like a Power Query expert, somebody who understands ETL uh, concepts, data data pipeline concepts, um, data engineering. Um, and so that's the first piece and then understands the Power Query language. So often people are coming from an SQL background and SQL and Power Query are quite different in terms of the way that they approach things. So you need either your SQL people to be trained up really well in Power Query and understand what the differences are between the two things. So that's your first role. Your second role is somebody who understands Star Schema, Kimball-based Star Schema modeling uh, to really understand how Power BI prefers to have their data models work. So that's that data model, uh, the tables and the relationships between those tables. And then of course, DAX, uh, Data Analytics Expression Language, the big, uh, the big thing for uh, Power BI, that's really where a lot of the power of Power BI is, uh, having someone who understands that that uh, deeply as well. So having a DAX developer is, is really important. And of course, this could all be one person, and it often is. They learn Power Query and DAX and mo data modeling, and then of course, administration of the, um, of the tenant. And so if, you, if you're going to be going down that rollout piece, depending on the size of your organization, you might need to have a few people that really understand those pieces uh, pretty well so that they can help other people uh, sort of adopt the tool and, and get it going. Great. Well, it's it's uh, top of the hour here, just a little bit past. I want to be respectful and mindful of our audience here and you as well, Greg. Um, so we, there are a few questions left. We will um, mm -hmm. provide written answers to those and post them to the website. As you can tell, this is a kind of a strategic topic. So the 
questions tend to be a little more in depth and therefore might require a little more thought. Um, so with that, I'll close. And first of all, if you want to move to the last slide there, Greg, I want to thank uh, you yeah. again for a great presentation. Thank you, our audience, for joining us. Um, if we can help you with any of this stuff uh, that we talked about on this topic or anything else business analytics related, please feel free to reach out to us. You can see our email there, info at centurus.com. We have a triple eight number if anyone still picks up the phone anymore. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to seeing you on an upcoming Knowledge Series event. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.